welcome to worship. The chorus this morning will remain seated for all I once felt here. So many people said to me last week, oh, we're away next week, on it, that uh, I thank you for cancelling holidays and things like that. Just to be here. <laughs>
that the next Sunday service will include communication, otherwise known as communion. I think there was uh, either me or the computer. Anyway, um, Beth has started working on the church profile. This is something that will be needed um, in our journey as we move forward. And there will be an email coming around to everyone. Um, and we obviously want everyone's input within where we think this church is going. Um, just one last thing to mention is that the Cabbage Music Festival will be returning um, in September from the 15th to the 24th. And I've left some of these in the lobby. If people are interested, there's information on, on all, all the uh, performances inside. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Charles. Our first hymn this morning is one that was popular in primary schools. Um, if, I think you'll know it, but if not, Marlene and Madeline are going to take the lead. Uh, it's supposed to be sung with a bit of a bounce. We have got that to bounce. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. 
After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Our next hymn is very familiar to you. We're going to sing it with a with video uh, because there's a there's some pictures in this as well. Dear Lord and Father of mankind. <laughs>
reading Matthew 14, verses 22 to 33. Jesus walks on the water. Immediately he made the disciples get into a boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. When I had the privilege of leading worship here back in April, the theme for the day from the lectionary was faith and doubt as we looked at the story of Thomas and the other disciples following the resurrection. The lectionary has given us the same basic theme today, so I've decided to preach the same sermon. <laughs> Just to see if anybody notices. <laughs> Let's see if we can find something new. Jesus' disciples are, are terrified on the Sea of Galilee. Certainly not the first time, as we know, the disciples are no strangers to the lake, actually. They have, it's where they have their livelihood. Before Jesus called them to be fishers of men, they were fishers of fish. Mainly they caught the, the rather bony creature called these days St. Peter's fish. Look back, back just for a moment to, from this chapter 14 in Matthew, to chapter 8, to the, the traumatic experience that they had not so very long ago. You recall the story when a windstorm arises so strong that the boat is swamped and it begins to sink. And scared to death, the disciples yell to Jesus, who's fast asleep in the back of the boat, Lord, save us, we are perishing. Jesus responds calmly, Why are you afraid, you little faith? Then he gets up, rebukes the wind, calms the sea, and the disciples are amazed. Today, though, it isn't the wind that uh, upsets the disciples. They can handle being tossed about by strong winds and waves. They've been there, done that. Today, they're frightened by something else. An eerie figure walking towards them on the surface of the sea. It's a ghost, they cry. But Jesus reassures them, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Some of you know that we recently had a rather upsetting flood into our lounge, with a large chunk of ceiling down and lots of water, nothing to do with my practicing walking on water or anything like that. <laughs> it's all now been repaired, and uh, it's, a, it's a great relief, it took a long time. When we were putting books back on the shelves, I came across something that was somebody sent me a while ago. Um, somebody sent me a copy of these, the, the, you know, bloopers from church newsletters. You know the sort of thing. Um, ladies, don't forget the rummage sale. It's a chance to get rid of those things not worth keeping around the house. Bring your husbands. <laughs> Weight Watchers will meet on Tuesday at 7 o'clock. 
Please use the large double door at the side entrance. Yes. <laughs> the sermon this morning, Jesus walks on the water. The sermon this evening, searching for Jesus. <laughs> it must be one of the most joke-worthy passages in the Bible. I remember, uh, oh, memory is a funny thing. We're particularly aware of that in, in, in our house, I guess, but I have trouble remembering what I had for dinner yesterday. And yet I can think back to something that was said to me over 60 years ago as a, an earnest young theological student when a very wise senior minister was leading a study today for young theological students. And he said to us, in the course of your biblical and, and theological studies, you will come across things that you don't understand, things that you find challenging, things that you find difficult to, to, to deal with. Don't get hung up on them. If there's something like that, okay, I'll look at it, then put it on the shelf and come back to it later. The uh, shelf gets quite full, but um, <laughs> I always remember that. Back in the days when I was working for a living. Uh, I spent quite a bit of time teaching cynical teenagers. You can imagine their reaction to stories like this. Walking on the water, sir. That's ridiculous. It's unbelievable. It's daft, sir. Those are the polite ones. <laughs> and without getting all defensive, I would point out that Matthew is particularly fond of this sort of miracle-type story feeding 5,000, walking on water, stilling the storm, because this was the sort of behaviour that you expected a Messiah to do. Or I could say how people have tried to rationalise stories like this. You know, uh, the rest of the crowd were, were shamed to share in their packed lunches because the young boy had brought his out, his, his loaves and fishes. Uh, or Jesus wasn't really walking on water, it was, it was an optical illusion. And he was just walking in the shallows. Uh, and so you go on and on. Then we reach the point of saying, okay, leave, leave your scepticism on the shelf for the moment. Is there still something for us to learn from this story? Let's explore that. We could, of course, say the John Ortberg line, which some of us looked at a while ago, if you want to walk on water, first you've got to get out of the boat. But I want to go a slightly different way. As ever, it is Peter who responds first in this situation. Lord, if it is you, command to come to you on the water. And Jesus agrees, come on. And so Peter does. But after just a few steps, the wind startles him. And he begins to sing, crying, Lord, save me. And of course, Jesus does save him. But he also asks him the question, you of little faith, why did you doubt? It's the same question that he asked back in chapter 8 when he stilled the storm, right there in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. And it's as much a question for us as for those early disciples. Calming a storm with his voice, feeding a huge crowd, walking on water, why would they, they all be like that? the disciples, storms break into our lives and scare us half to death. That's what storms do. It's only natural for the dog to hide under the bed when thunder strikes, for a child to cling to her mother when she sees lightning, for the driver to pull over when he can no longer see the road. But it's not just wind and rainstorms that scare us. There are all sorts of other storms too. Things like 
global pandemics, <laughs> political upheavals, or a frightening diagnosis, financial desperation, some tragedy in the world, or in our own community, or even within our own families, breakdown in relationships. In the middle of challenges like that, it's not uncommon for anyone to doubt their faith in God. That's exactly what happened to Peter in today's Gospel. And it's exactly what the disciples did in chapter 8. All Jesus does is ask, why? Like any good teacher, he, he already knows the answer before he asks the question. But he wants us to know it too. <laughs> Simply put, it is because we're human. Fear is literally instinctive. We're wired with a, a flight or a fight or flight response. And we have this reflex for a reason. When our lives are in jeopardy, or more commonly for us today, when our, our identity is threatened in some way. Our natural inclination is to run. When that happens, we, we tend to leave calm, rational thought behind. And we often need some help getting back to a different frame of mind. Elijah is in fear of his life, so he runs and hides in a cave. And only the what we traditionally call the still small voice of God, what the new translation talks of as a gentle whisper from God, challenges, challenges him in a, in a new way, brings him back out to face the world. Anyone who's into any form of public speaking, whether it's preaching or teaching or, or selling something, knows that one of the most effective ways to, to engage an audience is to ask a rhetorical question. Because asking a question gets the listener to, to think of their own answers and, and brings them in touch with the subject. Jesus isn't asking his rhetorical question. Why did you doubt? To, in order to shame Peter. Jesus isn't telling Peter off. He, he uses the question to get a frightened Peter to focus on the real issue. Why did you doubt, Peter? Think of it. You see the difference? He genuinely wants Peter to come up with the answer for himself. And in the realm of, of life's storms, faith is, is critical. Faith is the foundation of human life as, as important to us as food, water, shelter. Faith gives meaning and value to living. This is the message of the cross. This is the message of the life of Jesus. And faith is what Jesus wants Peter and all of us to focus on when the storms come. <clears throat> there are probably only three occasions in the whole gospel where someone addresses Jesus with if. The devil does it three times in the desert when he tempts Jesus. If you are the Son of God, turn stones into bread, uh, do marvellous things, uh, bow down and worship me. When Jesus is hanging on the cross, people mock him, calling out, if you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. And here Peter, impetuous, courageous, real Peter says if it is you Jesus command me to come to you on the water if 
Jesus doesn't tell Peter off for being afraid. Even in the most difficult times of life, when you you really begin to think you, you, you can't make it through, you can cling to faith in God. Staying faithful doesn't simply mean going through the motions. It doesn't mean saying the creed while you're thinking about a shopping list or repeating Bible verses from memory. It means for us, just like Peter, refocusing on our commitment to faith. We will not always be perfectly faithful. We've all known that. Doubts will creep in, but the important thing is to recover from those doubts and return to a place of faith. <coughs> our faith is strengthened and sustained by our relationship with God and is nurtured by participating in, in the study of God's Word, in, in the life of, of, of this sort of fellowship, being with God's people, praying, worshipping. <coughs> And each Sunday when we confess our sins, we admit we don't always get everything right. But we repent and recommit ourselves to walking in God's ways once again. Repent and recommit. That's, that's the real experience of Christian life. Peter is a prime example of what it means to live a life of what I like to think of as holy imperfection. He has misunderstood before, and he will misunderstand and even deny again. And today we see him refocusing on faith with a bit of a nudge from Jesus. And we're on that same sort of journey. A journey of holy imperfection. You will find it difficult at times. You will get it wrong at times. But just like Peter, you can repent, recommit, and refocus on a faithfulness that comes from a knowledge and love of Jesus, through whom we experience the grace of God time and time and time again. Why do that? Let's just be quiet together for a minute. seated to sing three verses of the hymn Just As I Am.
<laughs> all knowing God. You understand the way we struggle with life. So we bring our prayers to you and lay our problems at your feet. We pray for those who are wrestling with the issues of war and peace. We pray for those who are trying to bring peace into situations of conflict. We pray for all innocent victims of war and political upheaval who have no place to go to, to escape and no homes when it all ends. We pray for our own country where social and class divisions cause friction and dispute and we pray for organisations and groups that work to build bridges, find compromise and make peace, especially in situations where even caring professionals feel compelled to take strike action. We pray for those who have reached a point of desperation because they do not know where the next meal is coming from. We pray that in a world of storms, wildfires and <coughs> devastating heat, our government will prioritise the safety of the planet above that of corporate greed and short-term political gain. We pray for ourselves and those we know and love as we are grateful for another day here, so we hold before you those who are suffering from ill health or grief, that they may be aware of your presence with them and your healing touch upon their lives. <coughs> we offer our prayers in the sure promise that you have heard them even before they're spoken. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins. We sang her uh, last, <coughs> uh, last time I was here, but it just seemed to fit again today, so you got it again. In Christ alone.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and always.